maybe Dr. Bertoleski um, could start on this regarding um, sort of food, both in terms of the um, analysis, whether different cultural um, linkages about nutrition, how people eat more food, more fish or more meat, and how, how does that change our, our risk profiles and estimates? And then sort of, I guess, as a consequence of that, you know, should we be monitoring the food? Um, should be should this be done at the FDA level, or should consumers themselves be testing food for radiation? Well, first, anyone who wants to have a better version than what I presented can write to me, and I send you a written version of this presentation. And one reference there is to an article exactly on a survey of, uh, let's say, anthropological or medical anthropology survey of the lifestyle of these people from how they eat their home to what they eat. A pregnant woman in Policia ingests cesium beyond the upper limits considered permissible. So an average diet, daily diet by an average pregnant woman will supply more cesium than the experts allow or consider allowable. And I want to stress that the experts are not Ukrainian. Ukraine is a country that had to invent itself. And so that they rely on international experts to whisper A, B, or C. Now, in terms of what is in that food, uh, we use the Ministry of Health and other ministries uh, surveys of different uh, staples. And how good or bad that is, that's for us to know and not me to say, but we decided to use the official line so there wouldn't be any major disputes with us. So using the official estimates, Obviously, uh, milk is the major source of cesium, but they don't talk about strontium, and obviously milk is a vehicle for strontium. Uh, potatoes, but there is a tradition also to eat mushrooms. And they would eat mushrooms even if they glow like phosphorescent light bulbs. They're not going to stop eating mushrooms. If people stopped eating mushrooms, they would decrease their cesium load by 80%. Just that alone. And the mushrooms have no known nutritional or caloric value. So here is the contrapoint. You have to do humanism and you have to do science. The second point is there was a program where kids that went to school received clean food that was trucked in. That was stopped after the recommendations of the international community, for whatever reasons. So now the kids eat what they can. And uh, my uh, view is that that is something that can be changed instantly, is to make sure that the younger you are, or if you are pregnant, that you are eating as low uh, of a contaminated diet as you could. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and, and there's actually quite a few here specifically related to um, the waste storage and the impacts primarily um, in the United States, but also here in New York. Um, with Sandy and the recent storms, there's been a lot of concern about uh, impact on uh, nearby nuclear power plants, in particular Indian Point. And I think, uh, Bob, this is probably going to be for you to, uh, to address, but um, is the, we've been talking about the danger of running out of water. Um, what about too much water and flooding of the reactors? There was the Calhoun plant. There was obviously Sandy and plants on this, um, along the coast that had to be shut down because there was too much water. I'm wondering if you could comment on that and also whether the numbers that you uh, reported seem to mean that there was um, similar cesium amounts and cancers for 
uh, different reactors, but wouldn't like Indian Point, where we have a huge population center being close by, um, necessitate higher cancer rates? Or it's a rate, um, though. So it's the number, I suppose. When you have a react, Arnie could probably answer this much better than I can. But when when you have a Arnie can answer this question much better than I can. But when you have a a flooding event in a reactor. Uh, the issue is it's too much water in the pool. It's what impact it has on the safety systems of the reactor itself in terms of its electrical supply, whether it causes a, 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 a blackout where the, there's no more uh, cooling water circulating through the reactor or through the spent fuel pool, um, uh, the kind of damage it might do to the auxiliary buildings and the heat exchangers and all these other things that are necessary for the safe operation of the plant that could result in uh, water bo wa boiling over the water in the react in the pool which would it would still take a considerable amount of time for that water to boil off and be exposed but it's not a good thing to have boiling water in the pool um, put it mildly uh, so um, I'm not sure I've given a clear answer, but uh, floods uh, can be very bad for uh, the, the overall safety of the reactor system because of how it impacts their, their safety systems itself in terms of providing for the necessary electricity, uh, backup power, um, heat exchangers, these kinds of things as well. So um, the second question was, uh, um, oh, why was why, why the damage estimates? Um, I cannot answer that question because those calculations were done by my colleague, and I was not involved in uh, in the uh, uh, in the teeing up of those calculations. Um, I, I they looked counterintuitive to me, but I believe very much in the in in, in the acumen of Frank von Hippel. Um, if we are going to do something about the uh, spent fuel, uh, doesn't the, I, I guess here it says, doesn't transport and getting the spent fuel out of the pools actually um, introduce uh, more dangers? And then who is that going to be responsible? Who would be responsible for that? Would it be the companies running the reactors with the U.S. government, with the local communities, um, cannot use, uh, can't use nuclear waste fund, question mark? Well, uh, the argument has been made by the Electric Power Research Institute that our proposal of thinning out the pools over a 10-year period would increase the collective exposure uh, to workers. And my answer to that is that that's if you continue to go with your status quo in terms of how you operate and, and what your procedures and, and technologies you're using. Um, what the most significant impact it might have uh, is on the downtime of the reactors, is that it, you'll have to spend more time removing material from the pool and using this complicated setup which I showed you to, uh, to put more dry casks and you'll also have to have probably these sites for the most part, especially multiple site reactors, will have to have ongoing cast manufacturing capabilities going on for many years. Uh, so. It, it changes the whole nature and complexity of the nuclear industry to reflect what it is really becoming one of its fundamental responsibilities, which is waste management. This should not be an afterthought. Uh, there certainly are risks uh, associated with transferring stuff to dry casts. You don't want the dry cast to hit the lip of the pool. Uh, there are all these issues you have to be concerned about, but I think that uh, we can do this, it can be done safely, uh, and it, a it has to involve a different regulatory mindset and a different mindset of the reactor operators with respect to what their responsibilities are to the public and their safety. And to actually, very quickly, the sort of last question to follow on that, it, the new NRC chair, Allison McFarlane, was a co-author on the report you did recommending waste be moved to dry cast storage. Would you like to comment on where she stands on that today and the prospects for um, what you're assuming? What can I say? I mean, when you uh, go into a system like that, you, just because you're one of nine names on the paper, 
um, it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, political power. Um, uh, I think I think very highly of Allison. I think that she is a very capable person. Uh, but I think that you have to understand that she's one person who is uh, and uh, who was brought into the commission uh, at the opposition of the nuclear industry, and there are four members of that board who were brought in with the support of the nuclear industry, and so. Um, you, it's, he, she's in a very tough position, um, but um, I don't know what her position is these days on dry storage. Um, she doesn't I have do a know position. know that uh, there's more of it going on. Thank you. Please thank all of the members of this morning's panels. For a wonderful Alison McFarland doesn't have a position. She was put in because Mr. Jaxco actually grew a heart and actually had a conscience about what was going on in Fukushima. And so they had to put somebody else in that they could manipulate. So they put in Alison McFarland, a geologist, who says that she has concerns about storing waste and spent fuel and all that. If that was really true, then why did she allow the, the steam generator that was taken out of songs shipped up to Utah and not put in a covered building, but is sitting out like it's in a public dump? And if you don't believe me on that, Go ask Kevin Blanche.